and Green, and today we'll talk about understanding what a moment of truth is in closer detail, and look into ways of understanding if your moment of truth was a success. My paper is still under construction, of course. The key takeaways are that moments of truth define how consumers shop, and it's tough to model that. There exists a large wealth of research into how psychological principles may be operationalized in marketing terms. And luckily, these concepts appear to be of use in the context of the moment of truth. If you don't understand your product's moment of truth, you will never know how to make them better. Many of you watching are probably very familiar with the first and second moment of truth, and of course, the zero moment of truth. However, the less discussed third moment of truth, sometimes known as the ultimate moment of truth, is a continuation of Google's existing Zemo. This moment describes the post-purchase process that many consumers go through of posting reviews or ratings of their purchase, sharing that information on social media, and acting as either a brand advocate or brand critic, thus completing the cycle known as the purchase loop. Some of the principles that comprise of the Zima are distinct behaviors and stages of the shopping process. Only at all describes the terms show up web rooming and show rooming as distinct multi-channel behaviors that take place in a customer dis customer's decision making journey. Multi-channel, of course, refers to the swapping between services on a singular device. The web rooming behavior is when the consumer uses the internet facing store to perform product research and formulate an opinion of the product before seeing it in person. Once seeing it in person, the decision to purchase or reject the product is made. The showrooming behavior is sort of the opposite. In this behavior, the physical properties of the product are being examined at the product's location. The decision to purchase or reject the item is then made later on the internet at the consumer's leisure. The old model, as shown here, was one attempt at modeling the process that multi-channel users go through when deciding what or when or where to purchase. This is a very basic model and does not account for the switch between devices, nor does it include social media information searching or sharing. However, this is a fair representation of the process that the average consumer does go through to buy a product. You never imagined that the last time you bought, it, bought something looked this crazy. So conditioning refers to priming an individual to expect a certain response based on a certain input. This is basically advertising in a nutshell. Every fast food joint says that they have the best burger and their advertisements, quote unquote, show you why. Beltcamp et al. recently performed research experimentation on need-based behaviors and how humans may be motivated into certain behaviors based on either perceived or subliminal conditioning. This research suggests that stimuli can, oh, sorry, this research suggests that humans attempt to satisfy needs when they're deprived of that need. It suggests that stimuli can induce a desire to fulfill a need, especially so when the human is deprived of that need. And it suggests that through subliminal or explicit positive conditioning, consumers can be motivated to pursue specific need-based behaviors in the absence of need deprivation. Positive conditioning would refer to associating a stimuli with a certain positive response, such as combining the terms drink water with happy or good or delicious, or other terms people usually associate with nice things. In the age of information, not having access to knowledge can cause you to waste time, waste money, or lose opportunity. With that in mind, can it be asked if information is viewed as a contemporary need? Researchers Jones et al. suggest that yes, it is, albeit in a questionable way many, many years ago. The combined results of experiment one and two support their view that information deprivation functions as a drive variable in the same sense as the well-studied homeostatic drives of hunger, pain, and thirst. In terms of using this knowledge for moments of truth, understanding the base desire that humans have to search for information and what initiates the Zima must be vital in understanding how to operationalize it. Moving on from pure psychology, I do find it pertinent to describe the concept of fit and how it applies to these moments of truths. Do note that a conceptual framework is, for the most part, conceptual. 
there are not really many models or artifacts that I was able to associate with gauging the efficacy of fit. Fit is really more of a concept for how to think about efficacy. While fit cannot really be mapped or measured, you can get a good sense for how it can be applied to the moments of truth. Kakanaki discusses in her dissertation some of the methods that can be used to evaluate various aspects of businesses' customer-facing concepts. See, she suggests that you should be journey mapping to the highest level of detail that you can the product user's process of interacting with that product or brand, performing in-depth in depth contextual analyses with active product users in order to gauge their interaction with that product or brand's moment of truth. Product managers should be spreading the useful and accurate reviews around the internet on third-party websites as a means to boost positive SEO. And you should be maintaining, as a company, a high degree of social media presence in order to appear active in the industry and responsive to potential customers. Unfortunately, there are really no hard and fast metrics for tracking the success of a moment of truth. Nearly all of the information you could gather on the topic would be qualitative, and the ways in which you think about them would be mostly conceptual. That is not to say that a moment of truth cannot be measured, but simply that you, as a moment of truth practitioner, really need to invest heavily in the qualitative research methods that most UX practitioners employ. This research into how ZMOT and how to optimize it to convert and retain customers is all about 10 years old, so there's really not much content available. With that said, many of the prime principles that comprise the ZMOT and how to measure it are based on decades old concepts and methods that are rooted in psychology and business research and experimentation. The problem space is nothing new. We just have a fresh new take on it. Through this literature review, most of my recommendations are that of academic pursuit. You've really got to do your own research on this in order to understand the problem space. However, I put together at least some basic directions to get started. We'll read the entire Lydia Linta Kokonaki dissertation. It's only about 40 pages and much of it is very useful. You should spend some time understanding the Wolney research on mapping customer journeys across multi-channel variable device usage. And honestly, this is my own recommendation. Trust in the research that you can find and draw what implications you can from it. It appears that much of high-level strategy design which C-suite operations often comprise of, is purely conceptual. So find what you can and utilize it however best you can. Thank you so much.